people. Uh, hello, everyone. It is Tips and Tricks Tuesday on RPG with DBJ. Um, hello again. Um, with me, I have my two co-hosts. Uh, we will be talking about uh, common mistakes that players and GMs make. And of course, as usual, these aren't written in stone. These are just things that we happen to notice. But before we go into that, I have to have um, an introduction by my uh, co-hosts, uh, one of which you guys are already familiar with. Um, RP Gamer, please introduce yourself and what it is that you do. Hi, sorry, I just had myself muted. <laughs> but I'm, I'm RP Gamer and I, well, should be doing videos like DBJ does. I've, it, it's kind of the summer holidays for the kids over here, so I'm kind of distracted by that and day outs and things. But I will get back into it. I will sort my schedule out. It's usually the case of bad time I've sorted my schedule out. They're back to school, so I have to redo everything again. So, But there will be more videos out. And I'm all, also, well, just like DBJ, one-third... <laughs> of a publishing company, Power Up Gamers, which we've just released on print, Legat's Tomb of Amazing Creatures Volume 1, and currently running the Kickstarter for Volume 2, which you can all go back, but I'll let my colleague... Oh, you've got it! <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I got, the, I got the print copy, I love it. Um, <laughs> yes, so uh, my other... Um, uh, co-host is from Power Up Gamers. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Power Up Gamers or, or Pugs, I love that. Just Pugs um, is a is a place for uh, disabled players to feel safe in discussing how their disabilities affect their gaming and tabletop role playing games. And of course, I'm taking that directly from their Facebook group. So um, you will find a link to the Facebook group below in the comments when I get a chance to put it in there. Um, but please, um, uh, Jaren, please introduce yourself. Awesome. I'm Jim Evans in d and the Disabled ODM, founder of, of Power Up, Up Gamers. It's the YouTube channel, the Facebook community, not now an indie publishing company. Hey, so Cool, cool. Um, so t today, of course, we were talking. We and mind you, this is going to be. I'm sure this is going to be a very generalized uh, subject because we all see things or um, have learned from common mistakes that we've all made. So I thought I'd start it out with like what we're going to do is we're just each going to come up with a little subject about things um, that we've seen in the. The gaming community like mm, you know what we could do this a little bit better um my first one is going to be uh, a gamer mistake and it's it's one that triggers people a lot and it's called fudging dice all right <laughs> um and uh i think the for me the biggest mistake in fudging dice is uh lack of experience um it's it's taking dice and then changing the numbers around or hiding them or ignoring them or in a, on the player side, what we consider cheating and on the GM side, um, asking for roles when you really shouldn't be doing them. So uh, for me, the biggest mistake I see is, is having to not having the experience or skill to do have other techniques before it gets to the point where you have to fudge dice in the first place um yeah in, in my in my experience foot fudging dice isn't inherently wrong because gms can do it to make the story more exciting to and, to make and it i have seen gms do it mm -hmm. yeah, it's to make it more exciting to make an encounter last a bit longer maybe maybe you put a enemy that's too low a level for the party you've miscalculated so you're fudging the dice a bit to make the encounter last a bit longer but it's when they're doing it on their behalf that really that is wrong 
when they're doing it so they could actively going out to kill or injure the players. Like like your the GM rolls the dice and is and it, the monster misses every hit, so he decides no my monsters are gonna hit every hit instead. Think things like that. If yeah. if it's for the player's advantage and for the start for the whole experience as a whole, then it then it you could say it's kind of fine, but if it's just for like the GM out for player killing or just revert kind of just out for it himself it i don't think it works it's also reverse for the players i for example all in a one shot i ran and we had uh the guy ba- one of the characters basically first step in the initiative uh, and they fought what was basically a reskin displacer beast. In seven rounds of combat, uh, he rolled the same number each time, so it would be like an 18-18, because you roll twice of ice on displacer beasts because of their ability. And you it'll take the lower of the two numbers. And the entire session, he never will be below an 18. Hmm. Yeah. That right there told me it was a case of the player was edging dice. Right. And, I mean, of, of course, on the player's side, it's like, like why bother cheating you might as well just say you keep succeeding and then you know i mean it's it's kind of ridiculous in a way to 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 cheat as a as a player because why bother playing the game like you can get the cheat codes to a a, a video game and do it you know play yourself by yourself or something um but, you know, or or just be upfront with it and say, "Hey, I want to play a game, but I I don't ever want to be hurt." In which case, you might as well just do um, uh, storytelling. You know, like don't play the game; just just describe the actions that you say you want to succeed in and, and be done with it. Um, yeah. But to be, but to actually cheat is just kind of silly. Um, I I think that before it gets to the point of ne- of the need to fudge dice i think there's plenty of um there's plenty of skills you can have so it never gets to that point and therefore you don't break the immersion um like uh like scott post says in com in combat and out of combat die fudging should be considered separately i'll i'll roll dice for <laughs> for <laughs> none of your business as i'm running the game but in combat i roll out in the open you know it, it's I like I said before you get to the point where you fudge dice you you want to have some other skills it's kind of like watching a movie and then you see like the microphone come into the screen or you see like <laughs> workers walking in the background like it, it'll completely remove you out of the experience no matter how well the actors and the action is if you see mistakes in the background it's and you know it's fake um it pulls you out. So my first, first, the first skill I think people, uh, especially GMs, should learn is um, don't ask for die rolls when they're not needed. Right? If there's no chance, if there's no drama in the success or failure, don't ask for a die roll in the first place. I, I wouldn't and say that would even be the first skill, but that is an important skill. I, right. I would say the very first skill comes before you even get to the gaming table. Oh, you you need to learn how to build an encounter properly. Yeah. If, well, if your encounter isn't built properly, you're going to run into issues when you run it. And that tends to be what happens when die, eye fudging is going on is there something you didn't think of or you didn't plan for 
Um, I, I, I part of me agrees with you, but you, you can't. Pl- it, it is a random game, right? Dice yeah, are randomizer. Yeah, you can't and uh, plan bad that bad your your players are gonna hit every attack or get three crits in one an encounter. Or, or bet you can't plan if the monster's a suitable CR rating and if you're using the environment and, and rather or rather there's traps apps that's gonna affect, affect the encounter things of that nature can drastically cut down on any need for dice fudging but they can and also go the reverse depending on the uh, DM. Um, it could increase the need. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm apparently I'm causing some kind of echo or feedback. So let me see if I can testing testing one two three. Why am I getting back? Hmm. Hmm. Good. I'm not having it at all. Uh, they're, they're, they're hearing it in the chat. And let's see, that's muted. All right. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, does uh, someone have <laughs> YouTube up and that might be playing? It, that's it's possible. possible. I ha- I have YouTube up, but it's on mute. I I just have it up for the for the chat. Yeah, I, I've all, I've I've muted. Uh, my but I have a uh, testing testing. I don't hear it anymore. Hmm, yeah, no, it's, it, yeah, but my microphone's not. I haven't adjusted anything. Yeah. <laughs> I've got my I've got my spit shield up. I've got there. We go. All right. Uh, hopefully that'll do it. I hate to, I hate to plug and replug. And and it could just be hangout. Sometimes hangouts does red stuff. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you, you turn it on, don't change anything, and all of a sudden it's like, what happened? All right. Um, but for for me, when it comes to uh to encounters and and balancing encounters, uh, I think we forget that as the game master, like we we don't run out of encounters. So if the players, let, let's say I, I'm just making something up. I, I, I have six ogres and I'm thinking in my head, this is gonna be a great encounter. It's gonna be really challenging. And the players, they roll initiative or they sneak up on them and they just trounce the whole thing. It's not like, it's it's not like it's a limited resource, right? I can. Oh yeah, uh, that one of the <laughs> best tricks that would just the advanced scouts. Right, it, it, and then the second rape. Right, I've I've got more ogres. It's not. I don't have to. It's not like oh no, I've run out of ogres, and I I'll never have any more ogres ever again. It doesn't. It, you know. So, so my my opinion is, if you make an encounter, um, using the narrative, you can make excuses for just about anything, right? And uh, and so what I mean is, you have your six ogres, and if you if the players overhear them talking about the fact that they're um, an advanced scout, or one of the ogres is by themselves, and they're they're talking to themselves as he's trying to. Uh, figure out how to tie his shoelaces or something and and he's he's talking about um i don't know the the great you know dark mother in the woods that he's you know in league with or something or the players come across um evidence that the ogres have uh made these other raids and one of them has like a pet i don't know dire wolf or warg or something and there's evidence that there's uh, other enemies in the in the woods. You can come up with all kinds of things that that lead into the 
the narrative to make things tougher or to have a, in other words, scrap the old encounter and just make this the lead into another encounter. Yeah. Um, and, okay, so, and so they you could do that also, but oh, but that makes it easier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if 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 there's too many ogres and six is too tough for them, maybe one of the ogres cracks his knuckles and tells his friends to back off and says, you know, I can handle this myself. It, you know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> why not? You know, you, you can. The, uh, the narrative. Uh, uh, or you could have them fighting over who's gonna get the delicious halfling. <laughs> Halflings are delicious. <laughs> and and that's where we move in from like it being an outright mistake to they're just the GM just yeah. needing the experience to know when to bring in another a stronger enemy or when to ease it off a bit or yeah, and and it, it, what a, a great time for it, it can throw newer GMs off. They can be very nervous about it, but this is a great opportunity for the for the GM to role, you know, stretch their role playing chops. You know, and they're thinking, oh man, how can I change this encounter? Oh, I know the. The, the t two ogres are fighting over eating the, the halfling. One one ogre is, is stirring the, the pot that he's going to, you know, boil the halfling in, and he's just trying to get the right seasonings. You know, <laughs> one ogre just wants to wrestle someone. I, I mean, you could play, you have really uh, a great time playing with it, and um, making the encounter tougher or easier by just role playing. Yeah. Well, what I think yeah. it comes down to is that inexperienced GMs, the kind of panic if they see the encounter going too easy or too hard, they panic. So that's when they begin to fudge dice. And, and, and one thing, and even more experienced GMs tend to forget is, is mo monsters have motives. They're not just fighting to fight, usually. Hey. Yeah, I, I, I mean, even Scott Poe um, in the chat says, the combat attracts local opportunity predators um, or clever PCs could use that to their advantage. So, yeah, yeah they the, the ogres are making a ton of noise. They should have been quiet. Um, of course, they're stupid, so they want to attack the PCs. The PCs jump on the ogres, take them out, and then it attracts... Uh, I don't know some dangerous lizard in the in the the wilderness that's been a basilisk or something, you know, that's in the the woods that the ogres were trying to avoid, but they ended up making a mistake, and then the PCs jump on them, and now the PCs have used their resources attacking the ogres, and now they're in even you know further hot water, um, or, but I also think that. Sometimes maybe as GMs, maybe our feelings are hurt a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> wyverns. I love wyverns. And I yes, I pronounce it wyverns. Don't uh, don't get mad at me. Um uh, <laughs> actually that's how I pronounce it too. Yeah, I, I've never asked them how they, they pronounce their names, yeah. but I don't think they'll answer. <laughs> um but but um But yeah, I, I definitely agree there's it's definitely an element of GM pride, I didn't feelings attached to it. Uh, uh, and and I've gone through it and in encounters where players just totally demolished a, a monster that I thought would be too tough for them. Um, um, and then and and they struggle against monsters that and I thought would be easy for them, and I'm like, huh, what's going on here? And it's kind of like that thing because they the players don't know how much work we've put in to these encounters. To the, to them, we could have just said we could have just stuck on a bit of paper. They're going to fight a wyvern, and that's it. 
But to us, we've like spent hours balancing out this encounter, adding the oh. environmental. Oh, it, in. it can be a. For, for example, before I started gaming online for our home groups, we met once a week. It usually a hour session was pretty standard for us. In between sessions, I would spend about 40 hours prepping for my next session. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like 95% of the prep I did, we never used. Was, I, 30 years later, I got notebooks worth of stuff we never used. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't like the I, I I I love them because they find it so easy. But every time I watch them, I can't stand them. The GMs that come along and post a video saying this is all the prep I do, like one little post-it note or something, and yeah. you're like, how the hell? How are you running your campaign from one little post-it note? And I'm just like, I, I need pages and pages of prep to run a run a session. Yeah. I I've I've gone in <laughs> and I've had campaigns where literally the whole campaign was being hunted by the armies is of Queen Tiamat. Uh, that that was my only note on the campaign, and I would grab stat monster stat blocks. Yeah, well, <laughs> I I often. Um, I've made the argument to uh, other people that that say like um, that some people prep heavy, some people yeah. prep light, and how do people prep light? And it's 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 not that they're prepping light; is that they've been prepping for yeah. years. the The note card is just a little um, a small indication of the prep they've been doing their whole gaming life yeah. right mm. so so you could just write a few notes down like you said being hunted by the forces of tiamat and then maybe two a couple more notes uh they're in the mountains and um there are advanced scouts and then that's it that's all your prep notes but really those prep notes are actually going into your mind yeah. from things that you've been prepping for months or years or tens of years of 16 different encounters you've had in your head that you've never used or oh, definitely. or you've used and you've reskinned <laughs> or one of your favorite TV shows or a movie yeah. or a book you've read or, and you or a gimmick or a trope yep part, part, part of me thinks it's just G GMs like one one up each other and show off saying look this is all I need to be able to run a campaign I can't believe yeah. you need a book book for your campaign yeah. Uh, right. I I do think we, we that, love doing that. I do think <laughs> that it's kind of a sweet spot in between the two methods. It's where it's basically one page front and back. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. And now Scott Poe kind of mentioned something in the chat that I think triggers people, but it's it goes a little bit deeper as well because he says um. The easiest way to fudge is hit point hikes and cuts, basically yeah. increasing or decreasing the hit points. But my argument would be for people who feel like that's like a cheat, my argument would be that that's still a narrative element, right? Yeah. If, if you stab a bear with a spear, narratively, a lot of animals will run or they go berserk and you can't you they now get a burst of uh of endurance or um aggression or rage that prevents you from stopping them so either way and and, those and things really kind, happen yeah and my response to what you're saying actually leads me to the tip and trick i thought about when we first started and, and the, uh, my response is simply that those numbers aren't set in stone. And, and then the uh, 
topic I was thinking about was when it comes to like rule, rules lawyering thing, because ever since the original or very first edition D and D, it has been said in every edition that uh, these are guidelines for the DMs to use. It's, it, there's nothing saying and we have to enforce any certain rule, use any certain mechanic. Like it's, we just tend to because people tend to know of the system as a whole. Um, as a matter of fact, if you read uh, the section um, on monsters just before, just before the monsters, um, yeah. in the, um, in the player's handbook, uh, or, or, or maybe even the, the monster manual, it says, uh, GM should feel free to, uh, change stat blocks as they need be borrowing things from other creatures, oh, um, adjusting the damage, that's adjusting that's the hit points. I mean, it, it, it's in print. Like yeah. I'm not saying that they suggest it i'm saying like it's literally a if you want to be a rules lawyer the rules in the book say you can adjust things so the, the issue would be to be consistent though exactly right. and that's where it kind of gets a bit tricky when you uh, want to change things from what people know oh unless uh, unless you're going to do something the same way, like Fritz always work this way. Yeah. Uh, um, Scott Post says something in, in the chat. I'll read his uh, comment, but uh, it's something that I've always uh, lived by, and I'm a movie fiend. I'm a movie fanatic, too. But he says, um, by the way, that's usually in the PC's favor, especially if it's more dramatic um, that they finish it, meaning like oh, yeah. um, adjusting the hit points. Um and he says, a self, um, Skrakowski, I think is his name, who's been around for a long time, uh, says, kill your darlings. So I don't mind my monsters dying. I approve of superior tactics. Um, if the players, some, sometimes we as GMs are so attached to our encounter, we ignore the fact that the players came up with a great idea. If, if, if they come up with a, with a great idea and, it, and the idea doesn't have a rule for it, I usually err in favor of the great idea, the great planning. Like, um, I, I remember telling the story of uh, first level players, they killed like six harpies. And this was like first, I think it was second edition, um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, right? And I specifically wanted these, these harpies were actually quite dangerous then. And Oh, yeah. I wanted these first level players to run into the castle. They would adventure in the castle. And when they got out of the castle, they'd be powerful enough to kill the harpies and go home. It, it was a short adventure, but it was, it was like, go inside, get the treasure, get some magic items, come back out, kill the harpies, be heroes. So that was in my head. They decide to trap the harpies in like a double gated portcullis and set them on fire. And I was like, well, and, and my, so the, my first reaction was, damn it, what the, this is my encounter. You're not allowed to do this. <laughs> You're not allowed to be yeah. smart. And, and, and I quickly, so I sucked it up and um, didn't let it show. And I was just like, wow, that's a great idea. Like, you know, one of the players was like inside the, the portcullis and the other two were on the outside and they cut the ropes and it was this whole big thing. And I was like, I can't kill this idea. I can't do it. I mean, because in my head, I'm like that's sweet, like, you know. But I kept a stone face, and I, and I let it go, and the the adventure went on. And, and mind you, that was supposed to be my tough encounter. The the interior of the castle, because I wanted to flip it. I didn't want them going into the castle and fight the bad guy at the end. In in the room, I kind of wanted to flip it and say, okay, here's your bad guys, run for it. So they they did that, and then on the fly, I had to change my adventure. Um, I made some kind of bad guy that where the harpies were his like uh, 
underlings or something. It was this big thing. Anyway, the point was it screwed up the whole thing and we had great time. It was a, it was an excellent time. And that was when I said, you know what, these rules, there's no rule for this. I just wiped my hands of the whole thing. And I, I was maybe, I don't know, 14 or 13 or something. So, and, and I still remember that because because they wanted to know how I did it because they knew it wasn't in the rules. They specifically knew it wasn't, but they just wanted to have fun. And I was like, screw that, whatever. I, you, they're, they're in a cage. What am I going to do? Roll for damage. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, I, won. I definitely always tend to go with the cool idea uh, uh, over rules. Also. However, I do try to keep at least the appearance of rules. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you, you oh, need to always have that appearance of you know what you're doing. You you yeah. plan for them to do this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, for, <laughs> for, for a good uh, ex example, oh. One of my favorite scenes in, in one of my sessions, and they, they're they going into basically this evil temple for, for a necrotic cult. The killing cult is left in mind. And, and I had kind of planned it that way, a, because they're like 6th level, 14th level necromancers, the leader of the cult, or oh, oh. oh, so they think. Think, think. They get to the necromancer, and it's this big thing, and there's blood dripping from the ceiling, and, and necrotic blood is nasty in my eye setting. Hey, if you ingest it, you have three bounds ounce before you become a ghoul. Oh. Oh, so they're having to fight I on these rocks that are slick. There's poor necrotic blood all around them. They got this high level neck a man so just messing them up. Up uh, and and the whole whole time they meant to run, and uh, and I kind of stress that uh, as throughout the session as they approach, oh, they hit it just these multiple all, all screams and they see the as necromancer just killing like six men. And they're not even blinking. And they decide not to run. I'm like, okay, TPK. There's no way around it. But I did something clever with a twist because I didn't want to end the campaign. And at that point, because we were just starting the campaign, it was like the first quest out, out, out of the side of the city. Hey, I had the necromancer uh, open up a portal uh -oh, to hell right beneath them. Um, and, the, and they all made the deck saving throws, amazingly. Hey. A, but I had hell, Hellfire er, erupt out of the portal, which basically killed them all. They spent the next, like, three sessions playing as ghosts before they realized they were ghosts and got uh, a clipic to come in, in and get the uh, dead bodies that had been burnt in order to resurrect them. Uh, so so this step like that where players can throw you for a loop and 
it just makes the story that much better because you got to come up with something unusual. Yeah. Oh, the side, side note, note. Um, PC is a, a common, common mistake, mistake. that he made. Uh, uh, learn to run. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> Scott, Scott, Scott Post says, PCs never run unless you suggested. I never would when I played. Yeah, PCs learn to run. Yeah. <laughs> are, are and, right. and same with the, uh, the GMs. They need to learn to have their monsters retreat if it's not in the advantage to fight. Yep. Yep. Um, We've kind of, like, that gun talking about a second mistake that GMs make, which is getting too attached to what they've written down. Hey, uh, hey Brian, your sound just uh, seemed to have dropped off. Like, I hear you, but it's um, testing, That's testing. Better. Your sound? Yeah, it, yeah, I think we've lost them a little bit. Yeah, it seemed like the volume dropped. Or yeah, it's, it's it's hangouts. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a for me. It's very much a negative th thing, and it's kind of a GM call on what makes aches a better story. Hey, hey, and that's always kind of, I tend to ever uh, in favor of the better story. I, I think um, this is more like a myth. Uh, I think more GMs will adjust encounters on the fly in the player's favor than they ever do in their own. Oh, definitely. I, I, I would probably put the percentage up there upwards of like 90, 95%. Uh, oh, de definitely. A, a, like one of the things I've done um, is if, if a player hasn't done much in that session and, 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 and they end up, uh, coming close to killing a, a monster and they're describing thing, how they attack and what they're doing and it's pretty cool. I just tell them, okay, go ahead, describe how you kill it. Even though technically it might have one or two hit points left. Right. Right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know Brian's had a little, little, little trouble here. Do, um, do you, do you have one? Sorry, I had, I had to go. Um, are you hearing me all right now? Yeah. Oh, perfectly. Yeah. So, so sorry. Sometimes my head headset decides to not work anymore. Once, once I've <laughs> been muted for a while. But what have we moved on to while I've been? Oh, no, no, no. I was just wondering if you had a uh, you, you had a suggestion. Oh, for a, a stick. Uh, it's kind of the what, what was it? The some of the like a lot of novice GMs do when they're coming from other mediums is they tend to just tell rather than show when it should be the other way around. Yeah. They tell the players what's happening rather than describing What's happening? Yeah, um, that's a mistake. I've even seen the most advanced that GMs make. For example, you're fighting two goblins. Every one of us knows what a goblin is. It's instead of you're fighting the a small hunched over green skinned figure uh, uh, who just snarling and at you. Yeah. I uh, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I, I think and I, I like like you said, um a ton of advanced 
players do that. And I think it, yeah. it, it is where um, the idea that encounters become uh, boring and uh, people tend to, if, if you describe things kind of in a meta way, it takes away the, uh, the impact of what it is. Yeah, and, it, it tends to make it a bit boring and tedious. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the players themselves know what all these monsters are because they probably all look through the monster manual yeah. and that, but, but the characters they're playing might not have seen a goblin before, might not have seen, might not have even seen a halfling or an elf before. Yeah, and that's where one of the reasons you use the narrative and the description of the creature, because like I said there, it could could have been a goblin, it could have been a hunched over lizard man. And there's probably four or five different things it could have been. And from that description, and and even with the description, um, sometimes we want to, uh, especially as uh, ad advanced uh, game masters, like we want to, um, we want to dump a lot of information on people, yeah. so we stop all the action, and basically get frustrated that the players haven't read our you know, seven page <laughs> world setting guide. And then we just want to stop all the action and and explain to them what the city is like, or explain to them what the wilderness is like, or explain to them the history. Uh, it, and, they, it, and it goes in reverse also for players with, for example, with backstories. It's, it's, I've, I've had players who, literally will write a book for the backstory. Right. And you know, like a movie, it's it's show don't tell. Um our piece is perfectly right. You you wanna you wanna show your PC, you know, carving a piece of wood and making little I don't know, um like uh, pieces for a chess set or something. Or you want to show your your PC uh, whistling a uh, a tune while they're sitting around a campfire. Exactly, a, and and that's a very good technique that some of us use, is, and it's you use the five senses, and you try to hit it at, at one descriptor basically for each sense. And if you can get three or a, a, a senses, four senses, or even all five, you're at about the right description and level. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, the, uh, and and definitely, it, it, in oh, this is this, this, sorry, the sound is I is echoing in my ears too. And I, I've, I've been, while we've been talking, been, been clicking on my sound options and nothing's changed. There it goes, it went out again. All right, um, so uh, instead of info dumping in the beginning, like, oh, you're in the City of Shadows and explaining how the City of Shadows got there and that there's Thieves Guilds and explaining this whole thing. Um, instead, show it through their interactions before they get to the city, when they get into the city, when they talk with people, um, maybe the PCs get to the guard station or something and, and the guards look bored and one of them is like picking his teeth with a dagger and the other guard, you know, like kind of looks at them, looks them up and down and it's just like, hmm, you know, uh, eight copper for you three. And then he's kind of like rubbing his palm a little bit, you know, and you're gonna have to give up your weapons. And he's, and he's like, you know, blatantly like, hey, if you bribe me, you can walk in the city with your weapons. You know, and then you're like, please, he's might be like, hmm, it's kind of weird that the guards actually like actively like saying I can bribe them. And then when you walk in the city, maybe the common people have their heads down and they're nervous or um, every time they pass someone close, they grab their 
change person <laughs> and hold it close. You you can do all kinds of little things to make people um, um and, and you and you can throw in a little bit of telling, but you spread it out. Yeah. Out, yeah. out yeah. along with showing and for, uh, for, for example, uh, or, or you can tell a player, you're familiar with this, Eddie, you know there's a thief skill. Yep. Oh, and then later on, on maybe when they go to the thief skill, oh, you tell the player, okay, you happen to know this particular person here. Yep. Uh, wow, Scott Poe even says, and I don't remember this, uh, he says there's a perfect scene like that in the original Clash of the Titans. Perseus yeah. rolls into town and gets the 411 from a guard, which is, that's, and that's a great e easy way to to give the information across. And like you said, you can, this allows one of the player characters to to, to be the spotlight. Like, hey, you're the rogue. You see the children that are pickpockets. And when you look across the, I don't know, the, the market, you see the, um, the, the older gentleman and the pickpockets are his the underlings or something. Yeah, you, you see the fence watching them. Right. And you just give it to them. Don't make them roll for it. Just tell them, hey, you're, you're the roguish, sneaky one, and you see this. No one else does. You know, yeah. um, and you can spread all sorts of th things, clues about the political structure in the uh, city, a uh, throughout the entire campaign or session, and and maybe later on they find out they get hold of the, a note that oh from a stranger that. That informs them that the thief skilled guild is actually in power behind the city council. And and something another thing that leads on from this, another thing that G new GMs kind of do is they take away the spotlight from the players for too long. Like I've I've watched games where like a GM's done a conversation between two NPCs for like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And the players are just, I mean, I mean it's it's it, useful information for the players to get, but I, involve the make sure the PCs yeah. are constantly involved in some way. Yeah, and it's not just GMs. I've seen players hog the spotlight. I've seen GMs who don't know or how to like transfer the spotlight from one person to another. Or so. So there's a lot, there's some mistakes, it's kind of there. Uh, I, I personally actually do it in game. If, if a player hasn't spoke for a while, I'll have an NPC turn to them and question them. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot. Um, Scott Poe in the chat says, uh, uh, the, the that same guard eyes the party warily as they enter, but he sees, um, but you see, he gives the fighter alone respect for them to get that RP opportunity, and that's, I mean, in 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 many ways, this is that comment kind of parallels something I was going to say, which is, uh, steal the the game master should steal from the players, right? So, um, the paladin walks into town. You never particularly had a reason for this town to have a like a knight's order, but now it now it does, and you say, well. Um, you tell that player character, um, this town used to have a very, you know, um, ancient knight's order, but the corruption in the town has completely eliminated it. And you see the abandoned building that has been burned out years ago. And that, that throws a, a little bit of a, a, a little uh, spice for that player character, a little bit of their background to uh, say, hey, yeah. you're, you know, I'm telling I'm making the story, and you literally are part of this story. You, you know, your Knight's Order, yeah. your Wizard's Conclave, your Thieves' Guild is in this town, and yeah. you are connected to it, you know? One of the tricks I've 
and it's similar to that, uh, but it, but it's, it's oh, the captain and uh, the guard or the mayor or uh, uh, the county or uh, the city clerk, uh, de- depending on who the character is that I'm wanting to highlight. I, I, for a, a fighter or a paladin, as TBJ gave an example, or oh, the captain of the guard or is a retired paladin from your order. Uh, and it's known that he is. Yeah. And then, and unless the uh, player's given me a, a backstory that would exclude it, it, when they go to talk to the captain of the guard, you recognize your old manner or, or a rival you ha- had uh, while you were training. Hey, just whatever I think would be a kind of cool to see in the story. Hey. Hey. But one of the things I make sure I do is within the time they're in the city, I'll have, have something for each person or each player character. Yep, e- even if it's something small. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, just m- maybe even um, s- sometimes the, it's the small things. So uh, having an NPC notice I don't know, a trinket dangling off the belt of a player or uh, a small child um, finds the the half orc funny looking and interesting and wants to play with them or something, you know, um, the, 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 the knight has a uh, crest on his armor and the captain of the guard notices it and kind of has a, you, you know, maybe feels embarrassed or ashamed after he sees it or something. Um, Oh, Sometimes. definitely. And, and for new Uber DMs, um, a little trick using children is perfect ick, because they don't care, they'll say the damage to things. <laughs> a, a, they'll go right up to a, a barbarian and, and, what's those markings? Things. Can I touch them? <laughs> um, um, and then you get this barbarians like, well, the markings of my clan, etc. And kind of at a loss for how to react. And then they end up roughhousing and playing, or, or he, he ends up telling them stories of his clan and it can lead to all sorts of fantastic moments i i remember having a game i i had no idea what to do you're right about kids um i did have a game where um a a gang of kids i mean they were essentially pickpockets and such but the gang of kids come around the, the pcs and they become like fans of the PCs, like, oh, you have a sword and you're adventurers and they want to hear these stories and stuff. And um, it, I didn't realize what would happen, but um, I had one of the kids walk away and one of the PCs sees the kid get slapped across the mouth by like the, um, um, the little thieves guild thing. And you talk about players that went off, man. They Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, this this guy slapped this kid and they they were ready to burn this town down to find this guy. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the only thing that gets pl- gets play- players reacting wor- worse than if a kid's in danger is if an animal is gets oh, hurt. <laughs> yes, we're bringing it back to John Wick. <laughs> 
John Wick. <laughs> yeah. Kill but, the dog. Yeah. Every other action is completely explainable. I, I absolutely understand why you shot 38 people in the head at point blank range. Yeah. Perfectly acceptable. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share a, a particular example where I used a child 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 or child and the effect that it had was every player including the DM was in tears as by the end of the scene. We had a player his basic backstory that he gave me as DM was he hunted dragons because a dragon and burned his village to the ground um, while he was off, off leading a hunting party. Hey. Well, I, I had made a little twist on that, that because they were going into this elven city a, a, that was particularly known for its healers that some of these healers had gone to his village as kind of a natural disaster relief type team. Too late to do much good. But the player had decided he he was married and had kids and they all died in, in that dragon attack. Or so he thought. Uh, during this particular session, they come in. He sees one of the healers that he recognizes who's watching over a group of kids and has one kid that's bundled all up, sitting in really close to her. her. So he goes up to talk to her because he they need to know who to talk to in town, things like that. Uh, and this whole time, I the, the kids sit in there, all alone. They left me all alone. Oh, and, and I had this pitiful voice and all that. Uh, but what uh, we did was that ended up being his youngest daughter. Uh, the elf healer that he was talking to had actually managed to save her from dying, but she had basically been badly burned. She was crazy. And, and they went like 15 minutes with this. And then right at the end of the uh, scene, Daddy, where's Mommy? And right when I did that, all of us broke out into tears. And you could tell just from how people were kind of talking. And, and, and of course, because I asked players highlights of the sessions, that was everyone's highlight for that particular session. Oh, man, you're, you're brutal, brutal, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Punching them in the feels. Oh, oh definitely. But it, it, but it gave him a reason, reason and not only a to complete the mission they were on, but something to come back to because he was kind of going down this road as a character. I really got nothing to live for. I'm just, I'm just here uh, trying to kill this one dragon. But now he, he has a daughter to take care of. Wow. That's awesome. Um, um, so we're, we're hitting the, the uh, hour mark. So before we go out, man, here's that echo again. Um, uh, two things. First one is um, uh, RP has had an experience, and uh, I think it 
it can, it kind of deals with what we're talking about, um, where he went to visit a certain location and, and saw lots of uh, lots of uh, details. So I'd like him to talk about that, and then I will we will end it with uh, you, Jaron. But um, okay. our pick. Which are you talking about? The, uh, the robots or? Oh well, <laughs> robots too. But but yeah, the um, oh, yes, the the what was the name of the location you went to? For the the, the I've, I've been two places since we last chatted. The South South Lakes Safari and the Life Museum. For the robots, I'd, oh. I'd, I don't know which one you're meaning. South Lakes Safari, uh, for the, with the animals, yeah, yeah, it's quite because pe people don't know South Lake Safari is in the Lake District here in the UK and it's kind of a open air zoo kind of thing. That's what I like to refer to as where obviously all the dangerous animals are uh, in their own enclosures but the rest of them the birds the monkeys things are just all left to roam free throughout the safari park as you're going through so you enter the safari park and you can be attacked by marmoset monkeys raiding your pockets or yeah or a giant emu coming up to you right up to your face yeah just like yeah you've got food there Wait. We have some small safaris even here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. as, as where they'll bring like a baby tiger out, out and actually let you hold it. Of course, they have the trained staff right there. Uh, uh, what, what, what I was amazed was, even though they were in their own enclosures, they were massive enclosures and you could feed them at certain times. The public were allowed to come and feed oh, the yeah. tigers or feed the, but but I know I know exactly what encounter DBJ is referring to now. I've remembered exactly what our our good friend the jaguar. <laughs> 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 yeah, there was two two jaguars in the in in the park. We I got to them right at the end of the visit and. I, I got a picture of them and sent sent it to GBJ saying our mimic mimic friends are having a glorious life. <laughs> and for people who don't haven't seen that stream, you have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> but it, during the mimic stream, we were talking about a mimic becoming a jaguar and helping the party out and uh, becoming kind of a valuable yeah, pet. I, I remember <laughs> that episode. <laughs> so so I went and saw some jaguars and saw our mimic friends and. Got attacked by monkeys. Got chased around the park by lemurs. Um, yeah, fed some penguins, which was nice. Yeah, it's, it's um, uh, <laughs> it, that that just makes me um think that um, there's a lot of w because of gaming, we tend to think of um, uh, creatures and animals being separate, like uh there's only penguins or there's only jaguars or there's only uh, ostriches or something but for the most part a lot of those animals intermingle quite a bit if they're not predators of each other um in many ways i don't want to say they're symbiotic but they uh it's it's like a giant rhino may have birds on its back yeah because the rhino may be digging in the foliage and trees and rubbing against you know uh, the brush and then the birds eat the bugs and ticks that may try to ride on its back and uh, and the worms that the rhino has uncovered in the in the muck or whatever. Oh, oh yeah, a, a, a good example I've I've got from my from my visit to South Lakes. It's one that you wouldn't expect. It's not like one you find in the wild with a symbiotic relationship. But we were feeding the giraffes and you get the the branches with the leaves on and you hold it out for them to. Uh, pull off and that and twigs and leaves and stuff will fall into the floor and they they were in the same the giraffes were in the same enclosure as the rhinos and the zebras and other other animals and we saw baboons running over from from their little rock area and grabbing the branches and the leaves and running back off to feed the 
feed the babies and that. So yeah. they, they were like all, all like all intermingling, living yeah. together, not bothering each other, just quite happily. Oh, yeah, there's all sorts of examples. There's, there's birds that uh, actually live in a crocodile's mouth. Mouth. <laughs> uh, there's same thing with if some of the sharks and males, there's other fish uh, is, is that basically live within them. Um, um, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, but as DBJ says, when we think of encounters and that, we often think yeah. separately, like you've, you've come across a couple of jaguars. Now you move on a bit further, you've come across some some dire wolves and that and that and you don't but they but would they wouldn't, wouldn't you encounter them together both of them after you for food basically yeah. one would come along after the other what hearing the noise and that yeah. you'd imagine yeah and 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 you, you might come across them fighting for in your work or herbs uh, all sorts of things. Yeah, uh, fighting over a corpse, um, maybe um, <laughs> tearing apart someone's backpack from their camp <laughs> and, and trying to run yeah. off. The, the the baboons are trying to steal it, as well as the the the, the tigers also trying to steal it. <laughs> and I've, then, I've got a I've got another funny story from South Lakes because we we went into the restaurant to have some food because obviously you can't take food round the park with you because they they need they they get their specific feeding times and that and they'll just nick your food enough. and as we were having food we heard ruckus coming from the gift shop just next to the restaurant and what what we found out was the the shopkeepers have to have water pistols because the lemurs come into the gift shop and run off with the packets of like Maltesers and things like that. Run off with those sweets and things, and you're just like, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> right. Um, when I, that all kind of reminds me of when I was younger, we made the mistake of going to Kentucky Fried Chicken and taking it out on the beach at the ocean. Little hint, seagulls love chicken. Oh, see, seagulls love anything, and, any and, food you've got. Uh, but what it reminds me of in particular uh, was my aunt, aunt had uh, basically taken a bite of a leg of chicken and the uh, seagull swooped in and took it right out of her mouth. <laughs> um, and there was just this hilarious thing, uh, but it's like, like normally animals don't get that close to humans. And well, the, the scary thought over here, the seagulls have been known to pick small dogs up out, out of gardens and oh, take yeah. them off. Which which we kind of which as if you've watched regularly you've seen a couple of mine appear on this on the screen. They we we do fear when the seagulls are around in the back in our garden that and they're running around. We do I, I can, watch on I, I can imagine that like we have a yorky poo weighs maybe two pounds. Oh. It's just a itty bitty thing, so I, I could see a, a, a seagull, or, or, just swooping in and carrying it off. <laughs> yes. Wow, wow, that's it. It, it it's a shame because it's not funny, but just. Just imagine the little small dogs being carried off. In, in oh, we 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 we've laughed about it many times, say, wow. saying it wouldn't be long before the seagull brought them back. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, but what's nice is even though we're laughing and joking and telling these real life stories, you could use that by in an RPG. 
Hey. Hey. Oh, this giant rock swoops down out and, and pick, picks up your favorite mount. <laughs> <laughs> or, or even picked up the player character. Yeah, or even <laughs> easy. Oh, off. And you just leave the rest of the player characters. It's like, just describe it. You, you see them all going in, disappearing into the distance. Yeah. And and then it becomes a case of how are you going to escape? <laughs> Your party ha- has to figure out how they're going to rescue you, you. Especially if the rock's taking the PC back for food for its nest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's yeah. just, it just amazing how much inspiration there is out in the uh, world just on places you go events that occur uh, that that strange person at the bus uh, stop that you normally wouldn't uh, talk to because they're a little bit touched in the head to put it nicely uh, but if you pay attention to them oh wouldn't that make Ache a perfect crazy prophet hermit type dude. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So um so uh Jaren, I would like you to tell us a little bit about uh a, a little book that I happen to have. Uh, um, or rather part two of a little book that I happen to have. Okay. All right. Well, we can kind of combine the two, actually. Okay. A, beca- because volume two is going to follow very much the same style and feel as volume one, so uh, we'll have black ink art on the inside. There'll be 26 monsters, just like in volume one. You'll have basically the same table alls except for the d100 table or oh, in volume two it's going to be magic items and and we're talking pretty generic it's basically name of the item the effect and, and what it looks like 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 and then we have another location section with a whole new Ooh, 12 locations, which include sight, sound, sensations, traps, puzzles, riddles, suggested monsters. Uh, uh, so, oh, for those who have seen Volume 1, they'll get very much kind of the same feel L- throughout all three volumes because there is a third volume in the books as well. Oh. But right now, until the 30th uh, uh, at midnight central time, we have the Kickstarter for uh, the God. That's two amazing features of volume two. Oh. Uh, our initial goal is fifteen in hundred. We we broke six hundred as of last night, so about forty percent with like eighteen days left. Cool. Uh, uh, so, so I'm gonna put I'm gonna get that information too and put it in the in the details below to the to the Kickstarter if anybody wants to check it out and uh, the link to the first book. Um, on drive through RPG because I, I love myself some some physical uh, books. I like to touch them and, and feel awesome. them. So, and for those who like PDFs, we also have a single monster under pay what you want called the Dire Cougar on drive through RPG, and a fiasco playset at called fi- a fiasco in Camelot, hmm. uh, which is also pay what you want. Awesome, awesome, and and, and her that work. And I'm glad that uh, that uh, RP and Darius because those are their YouTube channels. I'm glad they got a chance to to uh, join in with you, sir. Yes, it's been a pleasure having them. Um, and it's about that I've been trying to piece together a little 
group to work with for over a year now. How oh, and these are the first two that are consistent that I can actually work with. And and something that may be coming up soon is is another pay what you want product. We started working on it last night, in fact, called the Durfan, which is basically a Chinese tile sea serpent cross Cthulhu type dragon. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I was showing them kind of the process of how how monsters are created and, and by the DMG and Jeremy Crawford has a blog article out that, that explains some of the mathematics it's, it's beyond I, how they do things. So we were kind of running through those methods as part of our writing time and came up with something that is about half done at the moment. So that might be coming out here really soon. That's awesome. Um, um, if I could make, make a, a little, little suggestion. suggestion. Um, sure. <laughs> long, that's funny. I'm sorry, I, I read a comment by by Scott Poe in the, uh, in the uh, chat. But um, uh, suggestion is, um, Google Docs, man, sharing Google Docs. Like, if you, you learn or 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 an appropriate uh, process thereof. Oh yeah, I'll get, I'll absolutely give you the links, um, Scott, and for everybody. I have not put them in the comment section yet. Not comments. Um, body the description. Of, yeah, whatever it is, the dungeon. Um, yeah. <laughs> below the video. <laughs> the yes, video oh. dungeon. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely will do that, so you guys can check that out. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, of course, do your homework. But when it comes to um small small press publishing and working with people, um, Google. come up with a method to share to to share information, documents, and stuff. Google. And I'm going to go back to a comment that Scott Poe said about. Uh, and this is a, a movie term is killing your darlings, right? Um, come up with your best ideas, be willing to destroy every single one of them. Yeah. Um, so maybe right now your idea may not be the best for whatever this is. Okay, fine. Put it to the side, save it, put it in some notes, put it in your own document, save it for later, but maybe for right now, <laughs> Scott Post is a doobly-doo. <laughs> yes. Matt Colville's doobly-doo. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, man, just... I'll, uh, I'll, gi I'll give an example of this. Uh, for Power Up Gamers, under our project folder, we, we have, I think it's 14 different documents right now. Our image, we just post quick ideas on whatever. Like, for example, one's an underwater adventure kit. Similar to Oath of the Frozen King, because that's where the idea of adventure kits kind of came from. So we want to follow kind of the template they use, but we want to make an un underwater adventure. So anytime one of us has an idea of something that would be cool for it, we go into that doc and buy our idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you'll be surprised how much work you can get done if each person just, I don't know, uh, one paragraph or a hundred words or a little idea. You can, with like with Google Docs, you can even change the color. So you can even... Like I'll I'll use red and go, I'll just put in uh, needs, you know, needs flavor text or um, like I might not have the idea formed in my head and I'll type in this creature lives in sandy area, you know, 
uh, guys really could use help or something. Just little, little things in there and just having people just be able to come in randomly, um, pick apart. Sometimes um, uh, you, you get s sparked with an idea. You can just go into the document, type a couple of lines, get on out of the document, and basically just saying, hey, look, I've got an idea. Um, it's a great idea. It's awesome. Let's put it in there. But at the same time, being able to say, you know what? Nah, it doesn't fit. Yeah. yeah let's let's get it. Let's get rid of it <laughs> uh, and use it for um, something else. That that that's that's um where we, where we came up with the method was um Tim Kearney's bucket method, mm -hmm. and, and which he talks about writing down ideas like a drop of water in a bucket, and then they'll come back to them. And yeah. and the reason for it was because as we're writing on a project with a deadline, what tends to happen is we start thinking about everything but what we need to be a focused on. So it's a quick method. We can hop over to a document, drop something down, then and come right back to what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's learning that skill that, um, like you guys, like we we are all easy, easily distracted. You know, a squirrel. You know, <laughs> and, and, uh, and and taking that energy and taking the yeah. distraction and using the distraction too to be creative. Um, hey. DBJ, is that a new brain in there? <laughs> oh, wow, guys. Yeah, listen. Oh, what? <laughs> no, not <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> so, so, so absolutely, man. Like, just being able to cultivate that to go from, like, like just what we, um, point blank, I've stolen the idea of doing this show from a from another YouTuber named uh, John Campion. And for me, this allows me to just randomly like, hey, let's talk about something and come up with different ideas. And you guys are, I know, are very much like me, where oh, yeah. you you have yeah. you have more ideas in your head than your, <laughs> your mouth can let out. <laughs> I got more ideas in my head than thirty years of notebooks sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> so but, um, another little tip I want to give for those who are going to uh, go into publishing or producing a product such as a supplement. Uh, a lot of people think it takes a ton of time. It does when you add up the overall hours, but Two hours, five nights a week. And you can divide that up five minutes to uh, ten minutes there all throughout the day and night. Or you could just sit down two hours straight. Hey, the length of watching one movie in the evening. Yeah, I um I'm old school. I'm a I don't have one of my notebooks nearby. Um, I buy I buy uh, classic. Um, here in the states, we have these classic notebooks. They're uh, black and white, marbleized, yep. checkered on the front, um, and they're like stitch bound in the middle. <laughs> um, and uh, yep, they're they're dirt cheap. This and, is, this is one exactly that I use as. And it's basically just lined paper. Lined paper, uh, an ink pen, and random things. I'll see a commercial, and I'll write down something silly in it. Um, it doesn't even have to be RPG related, but I'll just I'll just write it down. Like, yeah. uh, oh man, uh, uh, and, and then I'll write a note down to look it up on Google or whatever. Like, <laughs> oh, you know, like the seagull thing we were just talking about. Like already in my head, I'm thinking about like. Um, in in my head are monsters that do things. Because uh, I wanted to bring this up, the new book is about 
going to be primarily about neutral creatures because the it's, first um, one is relatively it's, evil. it's neutral or or possibly allies. Right. So there might be creatures that do things that yeah. hinder, hinder, or help the party, but they're not doing it. They're, they're doing it because that's their nature, not because exactly. they are they are evil. You know, the the creatures that want to steal your backpack or the the creature exactly. that right. pokes like, at the top like of your we head or something. Talked about the lemur, lemurs, for example, stealing candy or getting into your backpack. Uh, uh, that's very much kind of the f flavor we're going in for. Uh, um, we have a lot of oh, good uh, race called the Octona, uh, which is basically samurai octopus. <laughs> it's, it's, and, they're, and they're basically got the powers of Aquaman and the de defenders of the deep, they can summon animals that dwell in the seas. It's but the, the samurai like style race. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Unfortunately I can't take any credit for any of these. It, of... It. <laughs> so, so unfortunately. And that that one was actually one one of my players had gave me as a joke because <laughs> I because I was spitballing during one of our breaks some concept monster concepts ups and making little notes because my mind was thinking and like it does. Yeah. But yeah, I constantly have a notebook by me so throughout the day yeah. you, you two are definitely the last of the old guard uh, <laughs> I, I just use my phone for my notes yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I you, do you that do too. realize google yeah. docs is on this don't you, you do yeah realize I, you I, have... well that thing <laughs> is, is until about we don't use paper anymore you, you, until, two the, you two are the ones killing the trees. Until about really. a, a month ago, <laughs> I didn't have a cell phone that had internet. Uh, uh, okay, I'm not that old, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had a cell phone, but it was the old track phones that had no internet access. Uh, uh, so... <laughs> So now don't, don't knock, don't yeah. knock it, David. They're coming so, back into fashion. The old Nokia's and that. So, so now <laughs> I use I use whatever's at hand: my phone, computer. But I always have a notebook, and part of that is just because growing up, we we were forced to write things in the notebooks because. Get, yes. Kind of given by my age, age, we didn't have home computers. But when I if I hit like eight or nine years old, it wasn't till we were like a teenager that home computers started becoming a thing. Yeah. So it's, yeah, Scott posts one note in <laughs> physical notes. Uh, yeah. yeah, one note. I know some people swear by one note. Um, one note's a good program. <laughs> yeah, um, Google Docs. I know Microsoft has. There's a. Yeah, Microsoft Word. There's Notepad. There, there's all sorts of programs. I know, I know they have the OneDrive where you can use Word and that online now. So. Yes. The, Yes. The, the one difference that I've noticed, though, between writing it out on paper and typing in, into something is I tend to remember what I wrote on paper better than what I've typed out. I, I'm, I'm the same way. Um, and I think that's just because of our age. That's how we learned when we were young. Yeah. So it sticks yeah. with us more. Yeah. 
So, all right, guys, I'm 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 holding everyone, including Scott, <laughs> out there because it's I know it's hell of early for you for you guys. So, um, uh, here in the state, so I'm going to um to end the chat, end the, uh, the live stream now. Um, I want to thank my co-hosts. Uh, you you guys aren't in you, you guys aren't interviewees that I'm inviting on. You guys are just helping me out plenty of times. So I really, really love it. Um, oh, but, it's uh, always been for me and we've gotten to hang out and chat. Yeah. So um, as, as usual, I have an open um, an open door if you guys want to come on in. Um, uh, RP's always giving me great ideas. Uh, we've got some coming up um, uh, pretty shortly <laughs> and and let's see like we've got vince coming in he's going to come in tomorrow nice. uh we're probably going to do something on um on friday as well so yes i i have an open uh open door uh, what cool. is it the other yesterday i had um um uh, uh nate nathali he's uh in infinite role play yeah <laughs> he, he jumped in on the um on the using Good creatures, and we went through the whole like lawful and good alignment thing. That that thing went on for like two hours. <laughs> Man, oh, it's I crazy that. long, crazy. But <laughs> but again, um, you guys already know the rule, man. As long as we keep it positive and uh, and keep the ideas flowing, it's cool. So, uh, oh, definitely pleasure. And anytime I'm up all night working, it's a good way to uh, kind of run down before I go to bed. <laughs> All right. And um, I hope you don't burn yourself out. You guys um, definitely with the Kickstarter going on, um, you, you got to come back. Just do a little, yeah. do a, do another push if you want to. Um, oh, any new details or any oh, changes? Def definitely keep you up, up in the loop. Open. We actually do have a press release. It's oh, cool. now that we're sending out, 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 and we do t kind of keep it up to date with it, a percentage of the initial fund and how many days are left, kind of deal. So that's awesome, dude. Um, and and uh, and uh, on on behalf of the. Uh, as I speak for the greater uh, RPG community, um, I, I appreciate the fact, man, that you put yourself out there um, with uh, with uh, Pugs, Power Up Gamers, to um, have a place for uh, people to game that have uh, disabilities and stuff, man. Because I can't imagine, I yeah. I just can't and, imagine the hassle that you go through. Oh, there's been a lot uh, uh, throughout years as um, what originally started it wasn't just my own disabilities, but it was my biological father who's paralyzed with multiple sclerosis. So he's in a wheelchair full time. And I sent him down to a local gaming store or to pick up something or other for me. I don't even remember what it was. But he literally could not get in the door to the store. He had to wait outside on the sidewalk till one of the employees noticed him like two hours later uh, 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 just to buy uh, whatever it was I wanted. And, and I'm like, that's not right. Yes, I know they're a smaller uh, gaming store. But they could take out one t table because they had six tables right up front when you walked in for uh, where they would do the little magic, the gathering, where people would play D and D, things like that. And then they had counters and shelves in the back. 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 They could have taken out one table or, uh, and on the other side, uh, they could have taken out two, uh, two chairs and that would have gave a, even the bigger motor scooters enough room to get inside. I'd, wow. I'd, so something as simple as 
that little consideration uh, can be a big thing. But Power Up Gamers itself is actually for everyone regardless of race, special needs, needs, political views, sexual orientation, religion. Not, it, it's, it's kind of the concept. None of those things should matter or, or as a player or a GM. If it's brought up, it should be brought up in game as something relating to the setting. That's awesome. Um, which this is, uh, I've already got another idea for something. So <laughs> you should just spark the, so it, it'll be a subject for another video. So write, you'll have write it, it down. <laughs> got to write it down in my notebook, sir. Not, not my <laughs> Google Doc. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, and yeah, definitely game related. So uh, yeah. All right. So guys, thank you very much. Um, and everyone right, out pleasure. there. And have a good day. And yes, I'll put all the information down in the doobly-doo. <laughs> <laughs> there we go.